So uh, excellent cycling weather, terrible teaching weather. And however, I hope it is worth your coming because we're reaching uh, the climax of the semester. And we will uh, now towards the end uh, look at some advanced and uh, interesting topics, um, namely graphic models. I brought you the currently best book on the subject. It's around uh, well, three kilos, I guess, 1,200 pages. Uh, it is an excellent book with one flaw, namely that it's comprehensive. So, uh, you know, it tells you everything. And, uh, uh, well, sometimes it's nicer to have somewhat more compact uh, presentations. Uh, if you're looking for such a more compact representation, you can look at this uh, uh, draft of a book that I mentioned some time ago by Jordan, uh, Jordan and Bishop, or uh, really the, the very basics are also given in the pattern recognition textbook by Bishop. So uh, graphical models, we will Perhaps to make sure I'm not being misunderstood, uh, I could have added probabilistic graphical models. So it's nothing to do with computer graphics. Um, some people confuse that, as we noticed when we uh, were submitting a, you know, a proposal on graphical models, and then we got some referees from computer graphics. Yeah? So nothing to do with uh, graphics per se. Um, graphical models are characterized by Jordan as the marriage or the offspring between probability theory and graph theory. And uh, well, this uh, summarizes its advantages. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, We have probability theory in there, which allows us uh, to use uh, data in a, in a principled way. So probability theory ensures the entire system is consistent. And it tells us uh, how to deal with observations, with evidence. So it allows principled incorporation, or in this field, people sometimes say injection of evidence. Graph theory, on the other hand, allow us to nicely summarize these models. So graph theory affords an intuitive diagrammatic representation. And I think these are Jordan's words. of complex models. <coughs> Why so? Uh, because we have modularity. So we can uh, compose uh, complex systems from simple parts. And uh, altogether, this affords a unifying language. So today, graphical models has become the most important language to summarize advanced models.
And it turns out that some of the most important uh, time-proven models can be uh, formulated in terms of graphical models. So that includes uh, hidden Markov models, that includes the Kalman filter. And by the way, the diagrammatic representations of these two uh, happen to be the same, which also tells you, tells you something about the level of abstraction that graphical models work at. So uh, they're intimately related to probability distributions, but they focus on the qualitative aspects of such distributions. So these are examples for directly graphical models. And then Markov random fields that are very important in uh, computer vision, they're also fall into this realm. And uh, hidden Markov models, in case you haven't heard uh, about these before, uh, they're very important in speech recognition. Kalman filters are used for tracking. And Markov random fields are used in computer vision. So I mentioned that these two here are directed, and that is an undirected graphical model. And uh, together, these are the most important classes. So since they've been invented, uh, so it is a fu fundamental notion or concept, and as a consequence, they've been reinvented a couple of times and given different names. So some people call these Bayesian networks. Or BN for short. Uh, their representation is in terms of directed acyclic graphs. abbreviated as DAG or DAG, and they're also called belief networks. And uh, well, I will draw one in a minute, but, or we will study one in, in lots of detail today, but just to give you a single example here. So each circle represents one a random variable. And the arrows, or rather the absence of arrows, tells you something about uh, the uh, conditional independence relations. And this is exactly where the power of these models comes from, namely that we can easily encode these conditional independence relations. Everything OK? which are more important in pattern recognition. <coughs> uh, we might uh, next week uh, look a little bit into undirected graphical models, uh, which are more the realm of computer vision. So I mentioned those uh, independence assumptions, and they are important because uh, a uh, Bayesian network, so BN is Bayesian network, one that is not fully connected, contains or reflects independence assumptions. So in particular, uh, 
Uh, if I'm giving names to these nodes, I'm just calling them A, B, C, D, E. I could write the joint probability of these nodes as um, the probability of D given B times the probability of E given B and C times probability of B given A times the probability of C given A times the probability of A itself. In other words, or more generally speaking, if we have random variables x1 through xk, I can write their joint probability as the product of conditional probabilities of all variables xi given their parents where uh, a variable with no parent, uh, you know, that ha just has a prior probability. So remember, we have uh, P of A in there. And uh, parent is a variable pointing uh, towards Xi in this graphical representation. Okay, and that makes, so taking into account these uh, conditional independence relations makes for great computational savings. And uh, much of today will be devoted to understanding and exploiting these computational savings. Um, this is PA, which stands for parents of I. Okay, so we have... Uh, the probability of xi given, oh, this is a, a set of variables. These are the parents of uh, random variable xi. All right, now, uh, you know, we want to solve concrete problems. Uh, in general, the graphical model may not be known, but we have to uh, either estimate its structure from data or we have to make uh, prior assumptions to obtain a structure. Uh, to make uh, life easy for us today, we will start with a known topology. So we assume uh, or or I will give an example where we, where it's clear that we know the topology of the graphical model and discrete random variables for starters. And uh, mark that I wrote here a Bayesian network. Uh, so these relations are only fulfilled for directed graphical models and this is what we are starting uh, to talk uh, about now. Okay, so this... Uh, all of today will be devoted to directed graphical models. So the example I have uh, is not from physics and uh, I think none of us are in the financial league to uh, breed racehorses. Uh, if otherwise, let me know. Um, but this is where my example comes from. So we have a stud farm, a uh, farm that's breeding horses. And uh, well, these breeders, they try to you know, get the fastest uh, racehorse possible. And to that end, on the one hand, uh, you, know, you try and mate uh, horses that were fast in the past. Uh, but on the other hand, you need to retain some genetic diversity. And in this case here, uh, we have a, uh, a young horse, John, uh, which later on will unhappily turn out uh, 
to be uh, sick. And uh, now the question is, you know, where did that come from? And I'm using that model because on a stud farm, uh, this is a f the example comes from Jensen and Nielsen, um, it's a plausible assumption that we know who fathered a specific uh, horse and, uh, or who engendered, so who were mothers and fathers. Mother is always clear, father, you know, is less clear. Anyway, so who uh, 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 engendered uh, a, a specific horse. And we also know the nature of these arrows. So we know the conditional probability tables uh, from Mendelian genetics. Um, so as a reminder, Mendelian genetic, uh, if we have a recessive disease, uh, it means that uh, uh, people may be carriers of this disease without knowing because it does not manifest itself. But when two people who are carriers, uh, when they have children, uh, you see we have uh, two copies of each uh, uh, chromosome and <coughs> uh, a child may either uh, get two healthy strands, uh, in which case, uh, uh, in our example, this would this individual would be called pure, so it has no vestiges of the genetic disease, or it could be a carrier by getting one of the faulty uh, chromosomes, meaning that uh, just like father and mother, it it, uh, uh, it, it has you know it, it is a potential conveyor of the disease, but does not show uh, a concrete uh, uh, phenot does not show the the, sim the symptoms, and then finally. Uh, if a child is unlucky and gets two affected strands, then it would really show uh, the disease. Okay, and from this we can uh, construct our conditional probability tables. So we will be able to say what is the probability of John being sick, carrier, or pure, given that its parents are such and such. And the example is also interesting, I think, because it, it shows, uh, you know, the, the problems of, of inbreeding uh, that may arise because, you know, if in a in normal life, John should have eight great-grandparents and he has only five great-grandparents. So there has been some interbreeding here. Okay, before we uh, construct these uh, conditional probability tables, uh, let's look into uh, who is uh, independent from whom else in this graph. And uh, this notion is called deseparation. Uh, so deseparation uh, makes a statement <coughs> about uh, which variables are conditionally independent of which others in uh, in such a graph. And uh, to understand deseparation, it's useful to look at a couple of uh, tiny graphs, uh, a couple of prototypes. Uh, so there is, on the one hand, the serial prototype. Uh, or sometimes called head-to-tail prototype. Where we have <coughs> a variable A that is an ancestor of C, which is an ancestor of B. And we can express uh, uh, the joint distribution as probability of B given C times the probability of C given A times the probability of A. And if you remember LTA, uh, LDA, uh, we saw this model before where we had a random variable that told us which document we pick and then condition on the document which topic we select and then given the topic, uh, what is the frequency of a particular word. 
And on the one hand, so as it is without any further information, A is not conditionally independent of B. So in words, because you see A determines the nature of C and C determines the nature of B. So A and B, um, you know, uh, will be uh, correlated. Um, they will be correlated no matter whether or not we observe C. Uh, but here the question is uh, about conditional independence. Um, so there are different ways of writing that. Uh, some people uh, write that A not conditionally independent of B. This is not a pi, but this is this uh, orthogonality sign reversed, for example. Uh, and to make it uh, further clear that we're not conditioning on anything in this statement, one could also say that A is not conditionally independent of B if we condition on nothing, so if we condition on the empty set. So these are just different ways of writing down the same thing. And, well, how can we see that? The probability of A and B can be obtained as the marginal. So by summing out C out of the joint probability. And if I'm now using this factorization here, uh, P of A can be pulled before the summation sign because it does not depend on C. And that is not the same as P of A times P of B. Which we would expect uh, if they were conditionally independent. Now, if however, If, however, we condition on this intermediate variable C, we obtain a different statement, namely A is conditionally independent of B given C. So in words, A is conditionally independent of B given C. And to show that, we can uh, use first a Bayes theorem. So we divide the joint of A, B, and C by the probability of C. So, you know, if you multiply with this denominator, you will agree that this is expression is correct. And then again, inserting uh, this factorization here, it's P of B given C times P of C given A times P of A divided by P of C. And that is, you see these two together are just the joint probability of C and A which I can write the other way around as probability of A given C times probability of C. And now we can simplify and write that this is the probability of B given C times the probability of A given C. And if this right hand side equals that left hand side, uh, that is uh, the same statement as saying that A is conditionally independent of B given C. Okay, in a typical example where such configurations arise is a Markov chain 
where the current state is only directly influenced by the previous state. Okay, we'll look at uh, three of these uh, small situations. Uh, the next one is called uh, diverging or tail to tail. So this notation about head to tail and tail to tail that always refers to uh, the arrows. So this arrow has its tail next to the tail of the other arrow, hence these names. Again, the joint is written as probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. times the probability of C. And here we again find that A is not conditionally independent of B. So we can verify by writing by again marginalizing out C. And well, we can now insert uh, this factorization here. And that is not the same as P of A times P of B. There is no way to rewrite this in that form. This is why they're not independent. However, just in the previous case, A is conditionally independent of B given C. This can again be obtained as the joint divided by the probability of C itself. And if you now insert uh, this factorization, we can simplify and obtain probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. And that is the definition of conditional independence. And an example here would be, for instance, the genetic disease that we're working on today. So Uh, if we do not know if uh, the parent is a carrier of the disease, then uh, we will assume that uh, either both the children have some chance of uh, also being carriers or none of them. Uh, but uh, so depending on whether the parent is a carrier. But if we have already made the observation that the parent is a carrier, then there is still the chance of... Uh, uh, the child you know having the disease or not uh, you know it's not a perfect match because here we have two parents here I'm asking here I'm arguing with a single parent uh, but if we know that uh, the 
if we know that the parent here has the disease, then uh, given that information, uh, the children will be conditionally independent uh, given the randomness of uh, Mendelian genetics in a disease example. And then comes uh, the most complicated of these miniature graphs, and that is a little bit more complicated, which is why I need a bit more space. Uh, this is the head-to-head -head or converging configuration. Here we have random variables A and B, both pointing to C. joint is given by the g of c given a and b multiplied with the priors the prior probabilities for a and b and this time uh, if we make no observations, then A is dependent of B. So uh, P A and P B can be pulled in front of the summation because they do not depend on C. And for the rest, If we have, if we integrate over all the states that a variable can take, conditioned on others, then by the laws of probability that must be one. So that we have the probability of A and B given by the product of those priors, uh, showing that we have independence here. On the other hand, if we now make an observation at C, a and B will no longer be conditionally independent. Okay, and we can uh, again write down this uh, factorization, which I don't do now, and divide by P of C. And we then find that this cannot be rewritten as the probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. And now the uh, example with the genetic disease matches a little better because now we have two, we can think of these as uh, two parents having a single child here. And if the parents are not uh, related, uh, we would assume that uh, the probability that one or the other is a uh, carrier of the genetic disease, uh, those are independent. If, however, uh, and let's say that being a carrier is relatively rare, but if the child is now found to be a carrier uh, itself, uh, then this raises the stakes that you know it must come from somewhere. So one of uh, uh, one of the parents at least has to be a carrier. And so let's say being a carrier is rare, 
the child is only a carrier and not sick. Um, if we now find that A in itself is a carrier, this already explains the fact that the child is a carrier, making it unlikely uh, that B would be a carrier. So this effect is called explaining away. So A can potentially explain away a finding that we make in B. And doing that with real numbers is, an, is quite a informative uh, exercise. Okay, now there are, uh, we cannot uh, compose uh, big graphical models out of these uh, three tiny graphs that we've seen, uh, but we can compose them out of generalizations. And what we then get is a general statement, namely that when two variables in, in such a graph are de-separated, uh, that given some others, that they then also are conditionally independent. So in a Bayesian network, if we have two variables, A and B, uh, then these variables are de-separated if for all paths through the graph that connects these two variables. So these paths, they need not follow the direction of arrows. It can really be any paths. If we have on, if we find on all paths an intermediate variable C, such that, and it's enough for either to be fulfilled. So not both of these conditions must be met. Such that either the connection uh, which has uh, C at the middle is serial or diverging. And C is observed. Or if the connection is converging, and neither C nor any of its children are observed. So this is often drawn with a shaded symbol. So if we have an observed variable, this is shaded. And if we observe this variable in the middle, it breaks the connection or it deseparates these two. Or if we have an observed variable here, then these two are deseparated. Or if we have a variable that is not observed in the middle of a converging connection and uh, none of its children is uh, observed either, uh, then they are also deseparated. separated 
So doing this for a specific graph is a nice mental exercise, and we will look at a few examples after the break. <laughs>